Touch as many people as God would have us touch and encourage as many people as God would have us encourage. So, so this week, um, I managed to get all the way up here without my water. I think it's right there. I'm sorry. Um, we, so, so perfect life lesson. I used to be one of those people. If I couldn't do it right, I didn't want to do it. So there was a lot of things I didn't start. There's a lot of things I didn't because if I couldn't get it right, I just didn't want to do it. And I realized that if you don't try, if you don't try, you never do anything. So I just started doing what I thought I was supposed to do. I just started doing what God asked me to do as best as I understood it and continue to move forward in that. And sometimes things work out exactly the way I hope they will. And sometimes they don't like this morning. It's a perfect example. I tested everything this morning. The sound was fabulous. It was crystal clear. Everything was good. Then as soon as we transition and actually start doing the broadcasting, suddenly there's sound and clicks and fuzz and this and that. And, and, and I'm, tempted, I'm tempted to get discouraged. Tempted to say, ah. but then you know what? What good would that do? What would that benefit? I'm sure just like the patriarchs, we all have our moments where we're tempted to get discouraged. Just like the people we're studying as we go through the scripture, there's always that propensity to say things just aren't working out the way I wanted. Which brings us to Genesis 27 and the story of Jacob. And that is where we are. We, we, we may actually finish Genesis in the next couple of weeks. We'll see. But there's so many things to cover. There's so many beginnings in Genesis. There's so many starts where everything started. And so we've spent a little more time going through Genesis. So we, we had Adam and Eve in the garden. And then Adam and Eve out of the garden. The Cain and Abel. And then we move on through and we, we get to the place where things are getting really crazy. And so we meet this guy called Noah. And, and uh, God tells him it's going to rain and it's never rained before. He's probably not even sure what that looked like. And his faithfulness, one man's faithfulness to God, saves an entire world. And out of that, we have his sons, and we, we, uh, we come from there, and, and now we start to come, and, and people are growing, and, the, and, and things are getting, getting moving, and people are getting industrious, and then we have this guy named Nimrod, who decides, bless you, who decides they wants to build something to worship people and worship what they've done. And, and it was probably more of an astrological temple, and that became the Tower of Babel, and that's where God confused the languages, and now we have tribes beginning, and we have different people groups, and in the midst of all of this, God calls this another, one man, one person. Can one person make a difference? Absolutely. One person, Abraham. And out of Abraham, we get the promised son, Isaac. And then Isaac marries Rebecca, among others. <laughs> it's kind of how things went back then. Isaac has Jacob. And it's Jacob and Esau. And they're, they're born as twins. Not identical twins, but together. And we have a whole situation where... Esau is trying to come out first and Jacob grabs him and pulls himself and they hit. Jacob ends up coming out first. 
And now we have the story of Jacob and Esau. And Jacob, Jacob, which means grasper, clutcher. What can I get for myself? And, and Jacob's mother, Rachel, is looking to position him well. So she joins in the intrigue, if you will, and says, okay, here, let's help deceive your father into getting you the birthright. And Jacob starts by having Esau comes in from the field, he comes in from hunting, he comes in from, the, from where he is, and, and he's hungry, and he wants some of Jacob's stew, and Jacob says, sell me your birthright for a bowl of stew. And the New Testament tells us Esau despised his birthright because he sold it for a bowl of stew. He didn't see the value in what God had given him. He didn't see that God had a plan and a purpose for him beyond his physical needs at that time. Doesn't That speaks to me. How many times am I more concerned about filling my belly than filling my spirit? And I'm, I'm not trying to say, you know, go starve yourself. That's not the point. But the point is, he wasn't aware of God's plan. And so Jacob, very aware of the birthright of the firstborn, and very aware of what it meant, because probably his mother had drilled it into him time and time again, and so he gets the birthright from Esau, and then, as his father is dying, as his father's growing old, he, his mother says, let's disguise you, and he puts skins on his arms of, of animals to make him hairy and make him look, feel like, because his father couldn't see, make him feel like Esau, and he tricks he tricks his father into giving him the blessing. And we see in Scripture there's something to this because when Esau comes and finds out what happened, he said, Father, don't you have anything left for me? And his father tells him, I gave your brother the blessing of the firstborn. There's nothing left to bless you. Now, New Testament times a little different. Every one of us can receive the blessing of the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. Every one of us is entitled based on accepting Jesus Christ. Every one. But then, the Holy Spirit was poured out on individuals, not as it is now in the New Testament where it's poured out on everybody who will accept. There, it was specific people to carry the message and the plan and the purposes of God so that the Messiah could be born from a line of people that could be traced all the way back. So that you could actually follow the line of Jesus Christ all the way to Adam and the people who walked that line. So Jacob tricks Isaac, and he receives the birthright, and then his mother says, time for you to get out of here, because Esau is going to be mad. But we see that Jacob paid a price for his trickery. He paid a price for what he did, because he goes to work for his mother's brother, Laban, who is just as conniving as Jacob is. And, and we have this scenario where Jacob goes to work for his, his mother's brother, his uncle, and his uncle has two daughters, an older and a younger and and Jacob fell in love with the younger who is Rachel and he works for seven years to receive her as a bride and the 
and Le, and Laban gives him the older daughter Leah for his wedding night. Now, I'm thinking that probably tells us a little bit about the wedding celebration because he didn't know until morning he had the wrong bride. <laughs> must have been one amazing celebration for him not to be aware that he had the wrong bride, okay? But the reason I bring this up is these are the things that tell us the Bible is real. These aren't washed over. These aren't sugar-coated. They aren't moved. We see real people in real-life situations making real bad decisions, and God's still using them to continue to further the kingdom. I find that encouraging because I also am guilty of making bad decisions, of thinking about my physical need before my spiritual need, of considering how I might position myself for this achievement or that achievement rather than surrendering to what God might want to do in a circumstance and humbling myself, I'm looking at positioning myself. And we see these traits in the people we're looking at. We see these traits in Esau. We see them in Jacob. We see family favoritism. Isaac really did love his son Esau. He was a man's man. He was a hunter. He was out there getting game and he was he was his father really loved him. Jacob was a little more hang out in the tents, hang out with mom, probably learn a little more of the intricate workings of the business, understand how the, how the money flowed, how, the, how to receive and how, how things worked, how power shifted. And so he connives himself into a blessing, but then God leads him right into someone who's more conniving than him, where he spends many years having these things worked on in him. He spends many years having these issues dealt with in him. So then we get to around Genesis 30, and now we start seeing the tribes of Israel are going to come out of Jacob. So Jacob has, ends up having children with his two wives and with some of their hand servants, handmaidens, if you will. Um, it's a little weird for our culture, but it was a normal thing in that culture to, to continue to prosper the family that a handmaiden um, of a wife may actually have children for that family and those children would also be part of the line of succession and would be entitled to property and transfers and so on. So there's, there's a whole survival thing built into that. But we, we see a theme starting to happen. It happened with Abraham. Abraham was promised a son of promise and he was older, and he had no son yet. And so his wife, Sarah, says, take my handmaid and have a child. And that child from Hagar begins to be problem, problematic for the family. So he sends them away, and God has to take care of that child and, her, and his mother. But the child of promise comes way late in life for Abraham. Isaac has two sons born. The oldest is supposed to get the birthright, but it ends up being the youngest getting the birthright. And he connives his way into that situation. And now Jacob really loves Rachel. But Rachel has no child. And Leah 
keeps on having child after child after child. So you're starting to get a picture of how the promises of God work. These people did everything they could to make these things work as best they knew how, but in their best efforts, they failed. And then God comes along and says, now you're ready for your child of promise. And so Rachel births, right? She births Joseph and Benjamin. And she dies in childbirth with Benjamin. So Jacob is left with his other wives and his other sons and his favorite son. And we'll get into that later. I don't want to, but, but we, we, we see, you see this pattern. Do you see what I'm describing? We, we, we plan and purpose for God's will. We desire what he wants and we give it our best effort. And our best effort seems to just crumble in our fingers. And when we finally say, all right, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. He says, okay, here, you're ready now. And it's, it's not like we know how to make it different or do something different. Even if I thought I could do it better, my best efforts wouldn't make it work. For years... After I got saved as a young man in my 20s, for years, I felt like I was supposed to pastor. I was supposed to plant a church, lead a church. And, and I always thought, well, I was supposed to plant one. And so I got saved as a young man in my late 20s and came out of some real horrific stuff. And, and, and the church God plugged me into, um, people would continue to say, yeah, I really see that God's doing something in you. And, and, and people actually wanted to get to know me. And, and I kept going, okay. So I kept positioning myself and saying, okay, Lord, whatever you want to do. And for years, my best efforts never brought to fruition what I thought was supposed to happen the way I thought it was supposed to happen. And when I finally said, okay, Lord, you know what? After trying to lead a, a small start a church in a community in somewhere close here in Tennessee and having that go okay for a while and then that just kind of dissipated, not, not really anything wrong, it just stopped happening. And then I tried to connect in some other places and continue to figure out. And the one thing I did all, all, that, all that path, I kept saying, okay, Lord, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do. And when that first church closed, that I, had, uh, that I thought God had called us to plant, when that church closed, something inside me died and God had to wake it back up. He had to revive it. He had to bring it back to life. And then I came, ended up here with um, gracious people, kind people, and we were doing ministry together. And I'm all, this is great. I could be an associate pastor here. This is fine. This works just fine, God. We just leave this just the way it is, okay? It'll be just fine. It'll be, you know what? It's perfect. I love it. It's great. It's good people. We're enjoying what we're doing. And I, you know what? I'm good. And you know, for a year, I was just like, that's fine. I can just support whoever. The, and then the pastors come and say, well, guess what? God's calling us on. And we believe you're the man for the job. <laughs> and my initial response was, I think you heard wrong. <laughs> but as we continued to converse about it and over the course of an evening's dinner, I just more and more settled. You know what? Just like Jacob, I can't run from my destiny. I can't run from what God's called me to. I can't. I can't outrun him. 
I had been willing to say when it was no longer important to me to be the senior pastor, when that was no longer what drove me, when that was no longer of any major consequence in my life, God said, okay, now you're ready. Because you know what? He knew that if it was about being the senior leader, I'd get discouraged too easily. Because there'd be days when nothing went right. There'd be days when the ministry you were involved in suddenly stopped. And you had to look around and go, it's just us. And you have to be okay with that. And you have to say, well, I, I can't just stop because I don't like the way things went because there's still people counting on what we're doing here. And so we've kept going and little by little, God keeps adding little by little. He keeps doing what he's doing. And but it's no longer about I get to be the senior pastor. Ho, 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 ho. It's about whatever God wants to do. And that's the pattern we keep seeing in the life of the patriarchs. We see this in Jacob 